All right, it looks like I am live. Pretty interesting what's going on with this. Huh. Let's see. Oh, I see. Um, welcome to Roan Reds. Um, let's see, restricted, protected, and um, I want to learn how to post, and I know I'm early tonight. Hi, Leslie, I was just thinking of you. I hope all is well. I was talking with a coworker of mine who is a big cat fan. So we were talking about you, because she really only likes cat people. <laughs> Hello, Nancy. Hello, Lori. Oh, look at my early friends. <laughs> how are you all? Happy Friday. Just, um, going live on Instagram as well. So I'm not sure how, I think only two people at a time can see me on Instagram. It's kind of interesting. Hello, Mary. So I learned something about myself today. I learned that I have limited energy. <laughs> yes, Leslie, you definitely are a cat, uh, cat person. I did a, um, oh, look at that. We have some followers on, on Instagram. So I think only two can um, view at a time. So if you, um, and Instagram is delayed, but if you have time and you wanna join in and watch, that's great. And if you feel like it might be better, Facebook um, has me as well. Nancy, <laughs> yes, Nancy, you were early. And hello, Michelle, welcome. So glad you could join. Hi, Marla, cheers. Cheers. So I mentioned I learned a little about myself today. So I did a corporate wine tasting um, this afternoon um, for a happy hour and it was really fun, but I needed um, to not talk to anybody for a little bit in between. Um, and it was a totally different topic. So um, I, it was, it was interesting, um, really interesting to see um, how, how that would go. I think, um, yeah, it was kind of fun. Anyway, so we are I'm just going to give people a couple more minutes to join in. If you're joining in for the first time, we, um, we do a wine tasting every Friday night and we taste different varietals, do different topics. And tonight our topic is um, Grenache Syrah blends, specifically, actually from all over the world, I'm tasting one and anybody who has purchased the tasting pack is um, tasting one that is from California and anybody, um, and then everybody else might have blends from Cote d'Iron and they'll share with us what they have and we'll learn a little bit about where those come from. So um, thank you all for joining us. All right, so in order, I know we're missing a, a quite a few people. Hi, Corey, welcome. Um, but I'm gonna get started. So we're first of all, oh, we're also missing Keith, my husband. He's running a little bit late. He is riding a hundred miles tomorrow on his bike, bicycle. So he is preparing, um, but cheers to everybody. Welcome, thanks for joining us. All right, so here's what we do for those of you who are new. Oh, hi, Chris. Yes, make sure you definitely open your wine. So if you haven't opened it and you're drinking a Cote d'Iron, make sure it's open. If you have a white and you're drinking along with us, you can open it whenever, you know, the mood strikes you. All right, <laughs> which would be now because we're starting, I'm just saying. All right. <laughs> so um, I'm curious for those of you who join each week how the, the um, sound is because this week I'm wearing my AirPods. See if it's a little better. So let me know if it's any different. If it's not, I won't use them. All right. Um, so here's how it goes. We t um, talk, I, I talk, people comment. The comments really make it. So I, I encourage you guys, I can talk for hours, but um, I think I'm only interesting for so long. But your comments and questions really help spark interesting um, stories. And, um, and I love answering your questions. So um, it would be great if you can comment and ask questions. Hi, Melissa, welcome. All right, I also wanna wish Drew um, Bennett a congratulations. He graduated today and um, the Bennetts are often, uh, often join us, but they will not this evening because they are, um, they are celebrating Drew's graduation. So congratulations. Um, all right, so 
we need a drinking game of the night. Anybody have an idea, a suggestion for drinking game of the night? I would say, so what we do is when someone says a word, everybody drinks. I think um, sound is great. I'm gonna go with GSM. If I say it too much, you're gonna finish your bottle. That's up to you. But GSM is the drinking game, of the drinking word of the night. Okay, all right, great. So I said it twice, cheers. All right, so why wine? Why are we engaging in wine? Um, I, I found that wine, I really believe wine is an art form. It's a marker. Oh, hi, Andy. Nice to see you. It's, a, it's created by a wine, mar wine maker, a wine. And hi, Tina. Welcome. Um, it's created by a wine, mar wine maker. The winemaker is really an artist. They, um, they create the wine with purpose and with craft. It's a marker of history and place, and it's a great connector. I use it as a medium to connect with other people. I want, my goal is to help people have the comfort and the words around it so that they will feel comfortable engaging over wine. Um, it's definitely, you know, for thousands of years, um, alcohol has been used in healing. And as long as it's in moderation, um, it can be the optimal connector. So um, today I'm gonna turn you all into wine tasters. So we start off with our drinking game that makes you wine drinkers. Keith has joined, hi Keith. Um, he's enjoying his sip of sunshine beer IPA that he has been loving. Thank you, Matt. And, um, and but he has his GSM as well. And Tina's already got us drinking with her comments. The lights are on. Oh, they are. Oh, good. I just did a cheers for, for Drew or a congratulations. Oh, nice. All right. Hi, Christine. Welcome. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> Andy has started commenting, um, calling himself um, top fan because he can't get the designation. So those of you who hold it, congratulations. <laughs> I love it, you guys are so funny. All right, so anyway, we're all gonna wine taste tonight and we're already drinking. Hi Lisa, welcome. I, um, this wine that we're drinking, I'm sure everybody who has a GSM drink has a high percentage wine is my guess, um, high percentage alcohol. So this one is 14.2. <laughs> Remember when we did the Shiraz from Australia? It's a little bit like that. Okay. Um, oh, Tina Johnson. Maybe Tina Johnson has showed up as well. Yes, there are two Tinas, TC, I believe. And TC is also, uh, Andy is a top fan. <laughs> okay. All right. I always say what makes a good wine? A good wine is a wine that you enjoy. It all depends on what you're doing, what you're looking for, what you want to pair to, but a good, a good wine is what you enjoy. A top tier kind of uh, wine connoisseur wine, that's a wine that has some substance. It has some um, give and take on the palate. It, it lasts very long. So I just did a Sauvignon Blanc tasting and we're doing that next week. I can't wait. But some people had, um, you know, kind of the volume wines and those have a nice, a nice crisp, crisp taste to them. But I was tasting one from the tasting pack, which is the Sancerre we're gonna, we'll have next week. And it was just balanced, it had acidity, it had minerality, it had fruit, all of it going on at the same time and at different parts of the wine um, or different parts of the experience as you went along tasting. So, um, <laughs> so yes, we are, accept we, are, um, we are expecting some uh, high alcohol percentage comments <laughs> along with it. But this wine tonight, most of you, regardless of the price point, if you're drinking a GSM drink, you um, will need, um, or you'll, you're probably drinking a pretty good wine. Good meaning not just that you're enjoying, though that's likely, but also that has some depth to it. Okay. All right. So food. Anybody who has food, grab food, and you know it's seven o'clock, so you may have eaten already. But though not for Andy, that top fan, because um, he is in Colorado, so it's behind, he's and fan. so he's not. Um, and so Keith is here, he's just catching up. And so Andy will, um, he'll, um, so he probably hasn't eaten. So if you've already eaten, um, I don't know, Chris, if you had your Walmart pizza tonight, but um, yeah, definitely yeah. see what, actually Walmart pizza would go really well with this wine tonight. All right, um, so give us a thumbs up. Give us a thumbs up if you have recently been to a winery uh, before COVID. If, if in, the, in 2019 you attended a winery, you went to a winery. <laughs> Colorado. All right, I see no thumbs up. That's interesting. Can you guys do like can you send hearts? Can you 
Um, that Cameron Bear will probably be really good, Chris. Yeah, I can't see, um, I don't see any, um, any comments going up on the screen. So that's interesting. So I know that some of you have been to wineries in the past year and some of you I've attended wineries with and Michelle's on, I went to France with her. So I know she, she was wineried out by the end of our trip. Mark Schindelman, hi Chucky, thumbs up, thank you. All right, so feel free to share some of the wineries that you have been to in the last few years. Lori Bailey, we need to remedy that. Okay, we need to fix that. Um, but while you're sharing, while, while you're talking about whether or not you have been or not, we talk a lot about how you taste and how tasting is a combination of senses. Tasting is also a combination of memories. And so what wineries do is they try to create an atmosphere of, um, of, of that somewhere you're going to enjoy. So like even the 603 Brewery, that's a new brewery near us in New Hampshire, and they've set up like a almost like a California or a West Coast tasting room so that they throw open the doors, the patio, they've created an event. It's called an immersive experience. And then you're drinking their beer and you're gonna pair or think about their beer, their beer with those memories. And wine rooms try to do that too. There's one in Derry, New Hampshire called Apollo. Um, I really like what they do. And um, he, it's pretty much, he throws, he has a back patio and he'll have music and they're setting up memories, okay? And so I say this because as we're tasting, I want you to try and think about what these things remind you of. And I also would like to ask you to take a minute and just take a deep breath because we're all here for an hour together and it should be a wonderful, relaxing experience for you. And so after you take your deep breath, think about what, what was a great experience that makes you feel happy around wine, aside from the experience we're having this evening. And so hopefully you'll be able to pair that good feeling with your GSM that you're having tonight, drink. All right, Leanne says there's, oh, welcome Leanne. Um, one in Queechy, Vermont. I've not, I love Queechy. Um, and I don't know the wine place there, um, the wine tasting, but they've had some really great craft brews and craft alcohol makers move in there. So that's really neat. Okay. And so Chris says he hasn't been to one recently. He's going to join us in France. Oh, I would love to go. I'd like to go to the Rhone next. All right. And so um, I did all that. All right. So just thinking about, um, oh no. Greer's dog just spilled her wine. Okay, so this is a deep, a deep, deep wine that we're drinking tonight, the GSM. It's deep and dark. That's gonna be hard to get out. Greer, I have wine away that I can drop off tomorrow for you and you can spray it and it'll take care of it. Okay, all right. So a little bit on GSM. Stands for Grenache, Syrah, and Mouved. And Keith, you're not calling out our drinking game of the night, but I just said it again. So those of you who joined us late, GSM is our drinking word. Okay, so Grenache, Syrah, and Mouvet. It's been made famous in the Rhone in France. Syrah is from Northern Rhone and Southern Rhone is Grenache driven. So Grenache, like California, Cab is king, Grena um, Northern Rhone, uh, Southern Rhone, Grenache is king, Northern Rhone, Syrah is king. Okay, I'm sure there are queens, they could be queens. <laughs> Cheers, Melissa. Um, Northern Rhone um, is makes outstanding, like the best Syrah in the world, and and Grenache the same, similar. Okay, um, and it's called Grenache in Spain. So some of you who are drinking, you might have a blend from um, the Priorat in Spain, and that is Grenache and um, Grenache Grenat Garnacha. All right, and so it's made in many warm regions in the world. The Rhone is divided into sub subregions, and each subregion has a different kind of blend. And um, so like Chateauneuf de Pop, that is, many of you have heard of that, that is a specific Grenache, Grenache, well, Grenache based wine with many other grapes um, blended in. And that's what Chateauneuf de Pop is world-class, definitely a specific taste profile, um, fantastic. And they've actually had some decent um, Chateauneuf de Pops in um, the New Hampshire liquor store and in a lot of um, liquor stores at a reasonable price point, they used to be really expensive. Um, and now they're, they're much more reasonable. So GSM's drink are the way to go if you're looking for a, a really good all around wine, a food friendly wine, something that you can, you can sip around the pool um, 
you know, decent level of alcohol, decent level of complexity, and you want to show somebody you know about wine. All of those, it checks all of those marks. Okay. All right. So let's take a look at our wines. All right. Mine tonight is a Grenache Syrah blend. It's actually more Syrah than it is Grenache. I'll talk more about it later. But as you can see, it's really, really dark. You can't really see through it. So I would call that a dark purple. Maybe a garnet. It's got a little bit of brown on it. It is a 2015, so it's got a little age. So I definitely can see a little brown tinge around the side. Okay. Tell me what you guys see. What do you see in your glass? Some of you will have ruby. Some of you will have um, garnet, some purple, some, um, <laughs> some, um, you may even have some kind of blue hues through it. Okay. Chris forgot what GSM stands for. All right, Marla's calling hers plum, yep. And Lisa's is brownish, okay? And again, that brownish that can come from um, the intensity of these grapes, it can come from age as well. All right, so that's a, a five-year-old um, wine, okay? All right, good. So that's the color. And we're looking for clarity. Make sure there's no fault. You can't really see through it to see if there's any sediment What's in, in it. Diamond? What's that? What is it, like a diamond? A diamond in the rough? Color cut, clarity. color cut clarity. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> because it's well, yes. Um, and so um, you can't really see through it. So we can't it doesn't look like there's a fault. And how are the legs? The legs, how long it goes down the glass? It looks like port. Yeah, great observation, Chris. It does look like port where it's so heavy, so thick, and it's a warm wine for a warm night like tonight is. Absolutely. But it actually, I, I am feeling warmer as I'm drinking it, but it's also kind of almost like a comfort food, it feels like. All right. I keep showing you mine because I'm showing you my legs. That's why I'm showing you. <laughs> <laughs> so the legs, the more it sticks to the glass, the more viscosity, the more alcohol. And it also could be um, that your glass isn't clean. And I hate to say it, but if dust particles form on there a little, the wine will stick to that. Okay. Like when we had champagne and we talked about bubbles sticking to the glass. Um, Leanne says big legs. Yes. And she does not mean mine. She means the ones on the glass. Um, and Lisa says long legs, those could be mine. Um, Marla said it's making her sweat. Yeah. And that's that alcohol and that, yeah, that's the alcohol and the amount that viscosity. Um, so, oh, thank you, Leslie. Cheers to Leslie's great legs, GSM. All right. Um, so that's color. Now we're going to go to aroma. All right. And by the way, it, if you remember, Shiraz was super inky and dark like that. Um, for some of you, your, if your wines are Syrah heavy, which some of you might have, especially if it's from the Northern Rhone, it might have more finesse. So it'll be a lighter red. It won't be quite, and then you might be able to see a little bit through it. So if you have a Northern Rhone GSM, cheers, um, comment, let us know, okay? All right. And actually, regardless, let us know what you have. Um, if you want to share in the comments what you're drinking tonight, we would love to um, to hear. Okay. Andy's has long calves. Marathon calves, Andy, or just long, like, born with calves? <laughs> you think it's corked. Okay. Why do you think your wine is corked, Andy? Because of the size of the calves, or does it taste like stewed vegetables? Okay. Or smell super vegetally or vinegary? Okay, go ahead and answer that. That will take a minute. Um, so aromas. How do you know if it's northern? Marla, I know what you have, and it's southern. Okay. You'd have to look it up. You'd have to look up the location in the specific. Actually, you have a couple. You'd have to look it up online to know. There's so many villages, I couldn't tell you. Um, but with your, yeah, it could be either. Okay, so when we smell it, what do you smell? Okay, first smell it. Without swirling, then smell it with the swirl. Interesting. Okay, tell me what you guys take or get, get. All right, those of you who are drinking the same thing as me, it's a Grenache Syrah blend, Syrah Grenache blend. And I lead with Syrah 
because there's more Syrah than there is. There's 65% Syrah and 35% Grenache. Um, Lisa says she gets alcohol first, then thick berry. Interesting. Lori's got a 2014 CMS. Very interesting, Lori. She's got a Cab Merlot Syrah from Washington. So it's going to be more cab driven. You're not going to get a lot of Syrah if it's ending with the S. So your tasting characteristics probably won't match this, but they'll still be very interesting. Okay. Marla gets lots of alcohol and black cherry. Yes, absolutely. Leslie's getting the earth. Interesting. Yeah, there's definitely that earth. It's like a deep overtone. Like if you, it's almost truffly. Like th if you think about um, earth or potting soil and you smell that potting soil, <clears throat> can you smell that then in your wine? And it's not quite like planting soil. I should be careful. It's more like earth, like, um, and I say truffly, um, it's more like dry earth, not wet. And it has almost like a, when it first rains and it's a Swedish sweet smell, that's that earth smell. And that's what I'm saying in terms of truffles. And that's definitely in this one. Andy said vinegary, um, could be an acquired taste. Andy, let it open up a little, definitely swirl it in your glass to aerate it, warm it up. If it's chilly, warm it up with your hands. Cause if it's cold, it can have a vinegary um, taste to it. And if worse comes to worse, if you take a good, okay, cheat. If you take a good wine, and swirl it around your glass and then add that it'll make it taste good it, it you don't have to have a lot you just have to coat the glass a little bit of good wine <laughs> so um yeah so uh, melissa's is earthy um it could be good with chocolate definitely could be melissa okay all right good so um for our aromas we are getting plum spices leather here's what comes so mine has plum spices leather here's what comes from the grenache versus the Syrah versus the Mouved. You're, in Grenache, you're gonna get like citrus and spice and cherry with some herbal, maybe some oregano. From the Syrah, you're gonna get smoke, bacon, herbs, red and black fruit, some pepper and some floral notes. And then if you have Mouved, which I do not have in mine, um, but a lot of Rhone varietals <clears throat> will have that M part. You'll have dark fruit, violet flowers, herbs, black pepper, thyme, and also like a gamey kind of a red meat from the Mouved. Okay, that's a smell. It's from the grape itself. It's not from anything else. All right, Leanne got the leather. Interesting, yeah. And so Leanne calls out a great point. We, and what we're doing is learning how to put the right words on it. It's like a few weeks ago when Gail said, I taste something sweet. And in her descriptor was, um, was juicy pear. And all of a sudden it clicked for her. That's what juicy pear and wine tastes like. Good for you, Leanne, that leather, picking up that leather. You're all awesome. All right, let's do the, the taste. So we do one taste. And then a second. Wow, this is big. This one's really big. Okay, Lisa just got the smoke. Yep, yep, good, good. And that's it. So think about it when it first hits your palate. What are you tasting? Then in a second two or two later, what are you tasting? And then a, another few seconds, what are you tasting? And then what are you tasting now? I don't know how many seconds went by, but I still feel and taste mine. Okay. All right. So Marla says, um, Chris's was vinegar. Uh, oh, hers was vinegary at first. Um, did someone else say? I think I missed, if I missed your comment, please feel free to, to comment again. Um, so um, interesting, all right. And the vinegar, sometimes that's just because it's been in the bottle for a while and you need to let it open up and let, the, let it aerate a little. Um, oh, Marla said, yeah, after hers decanted, yes. And that can happen, especially if you're drinking in the um, like 15 to $25 range, those wines, um, they're crafted a little differently, not quite handcrafted. They may come from several different vineyards. They may need, especially out of France, um, a little bit more time to open up, okay? Um, and interesting, Melissa, yours seems heavy. You're gonna have to comment and let us know what you're drinking, but definitely heavy. Those GSMs drink are heavy. All right. Um, all right, so what are you tasting? What do we get? We got smoke, we got leather. What else are you tasting? What fruits? Let's start with the fruits. 
What fruits? I got black. I got red. What are those black fruits? The blackberry, the blueberry. I'm not really getting blueberry. Black plum. Um, and then the red fruits, uh, red cherries. I'm not getting red cherry. Oh, actually, I am getting red cherry now that I say it. See, isn't that funny the way it happens? I said it, picturing what it tastes like, and now I have it. The finish is forever. It is. It's so such a big wine. Um, and so there's red fruits and black fruits in there. There's no citrus, right? No citrus. Leanne's getting the black cherry. Yeah, it's a big black cherry. Yeah. Um, is there black raspberry? Yeah, maybe, maybe. Okay. Marla's getting black cherry, strawberry, and raspberry. Yes, all of those. Okay. So you get the the red, you get the black. Um, so in for, here's what you're getting from the different um, combinations of GSM drink. Grenache, you get orange rinds, ruby red grapefruit, spiced cherry, as I said. And then from old world regions like the Rhone, you may get herbs, oregano, you might even get tobacco, okay, which ours has. The Syrah, smoke, bacon, herbs, red and black fruits, white and black pepper. They do taste different, by the way. Um, and floral violet notes, violet. You get violet from Syrah. I love that, okay? So if you picture smelling a violet, or even, okay, I, it's probably not good for you, so don't do it. But if you picture chewing a violet, and I don't know, I'm very visual and, um, and yeah, I can kind of picture it and, and I, how it might taste. And that's, that's the violet. That's the violet that you pull out. And then Mouved, you're going to get the dark fruits, flowers like violet, and then aromas of black pepper thyme. And as I mentioned, that game, okay? So all of that can be in your glass. And I said this earlier, but it's true. It is crazy what is going on in this glass. When we drink good wine, there's so much going on. And when I, again, good wine, if it's high volume, it's not handcrafted, there's usually less dimensions. If it's handcrafted, if it's good wine, there are more dimensions to it. Um, and I do want to call out all the wines that I sell are all handcrafted. Um, and most of them are organic or biodynamic. And they all have, um, they're all not simple. They're all, you know, have a depth to them. So um, just want to share that. Um, okay. And so definitely in this wine, and you might also get strewed, uh, stewed strawberry. Um, you're going to feel that alcohol on your palate. And the Syrah also gives you some structure on your palate. Um, maybe some licorice you might get. There's some acidity in there. And someone called that out earlier. There's definitely spice. And you might also get, like I got some graphite and some nutmeg as a spice. Um, and we, we called out that earth earlier. You getting it, Keith? <laughs> Keith says GSM, drink. <laughs> Red dirt, Melissa, where is that from? Tell us where that's from. Oh, that sounds like a, um, it sounds like a, um, a California, definitely is a US. And Lori, yours is from Washington. Did you tell us the name of it? Curious. All right. Marla says there's a floral element to hers. And she smelled it after she drank it on the finish. But she's not sure what flowers. Definitely sweet flowers. Yep. So it could be violet. It could be rose. Um, it could be white flowers, though typically on a darker a darker wine, it's, it's not. Um, and now Marla brings up a point that I'm going to talk about later. But what happens throughout the room is that there are these crazy herbs all throughout the, the vineyards. And so the wines pick up those herbs and those flowers and those, those tastes. So um, interesting. All right. So tonight, I'm, gonna I'm just going to tell you a little bit about mine. It's the Ampelos Sirach. That's the name of it. I don't know why I always want to tip my wine towards you, but I do. <laughs> this is the Ampelos Sirach. And the family has ties to Greece. They actually own a little, um, a, a little uh, residence, bed and breakfast in Greece. And so they have a very interesting story. And I love, I love the stories of the winemakers because it's just so interesting. A lot of them are not farmers. So these guys, it's a husband and a wife, and he um, is um, he he was working in tech. She was working in tech, and 9/11 um, hit. And right after 9-11, they kind of took stock and she sold her company, her tech company, her startup, and they had their nest egg and they took that and they bought these lands. Okay. And I'm going to show you 
This is their vineyard, okay? Facebook, Instagram. And when they bought it, it was just, I mean, dirt. It was just soil. It really was undeveloped. And it's Central Coast, California, which you would think is super warm, but they're actually their number one wine, their top wine, because it's um, the, the husband's favorite is Pinot Noir. They make beautiful Pinot Noir, which is a cold climate grape. They were the first winery to be orga certified by organic and biodynamic. And they basically in 2001 bought this property and learned how to farm. They hired somebody who taught them how to make wine and they learned how to farm and they learned how to make wine. And they have a huge respect for the environment. They have owls that eat the bugs, they have bugs that eat the whatever, and it's all biodynamic. They have a solar panel that um, runs all of the energy that goes into this beautiful winery. And the name is Ampelos, which is Greek for wine. If you go on their website, they have a whole bunch of wine tasting videos. The husband and the wife drive out, Peter and um, Rebecca, drive their truck out into different spots in their vineyard and they taste while they're in their truck like they'll do the it, it's, it's fun it's really fun so they have a few of those online not for the sirash unfortunately but for the for some of the others that they sell so it's in the santa, Hita, santa rita hills so it's just two hours if you go two hours north west of LA. It's a little peak. And their vineyards, you would, as I said, you'd think they'd be warm climate, but they have an opening to the Pacific Ocean. So the wind and the breeze comes in off the Pacific Ocean and it makes it a cooler climate. So it's pretty cool. Um, and thank you, Chris. I'm glad that you like that. And yeah, it's not subtle. This one too, like we talked about the Shiraz from Australia. It's almost like a punch in the face. I feel like this one, the one that we're drinking is as well. All right. So, um, they are warmer, they are warmer in climate than most of Europe where they make GSM drink, but um, the, they, um, they have that ocean breeze that makes it cooler. Oh, and they have a fog. I posted a picture, it's on Artisan Wine Group and I tried, my printer is, is dying um, today, but I don't know if you can see, this is their vineyard and these are the fogs that settle. So these fogs roll in from the Pacific Ocean and they settle into their vineyards. And so you might think, oh, that's cool. Bring a little precipitation, um, cool the vineyards down a little. But they also bring salt water, which drops onto the, into the vineyards and goes into the soil and ends up um, affecting, adding kind of a sea salt-ish piece to some of their wines. So their, their Pinot Noirs likely have that sea salt piece. Okay. Um, so another cool thing about this is they only made 30 barrels so 30 barrels and we get to taste it which is i'm very happy about okay um very small production handcrafted hand harvested fantastic um this one is um on the aromas it's plum spices and leather and then on the taste it's strawberry plum it's got an acidity a spice oh it has some graphite which if you imagine like a pencil you can a pencil, you can lick a pencil, I'm okay with that, or put it in your wine. Um, so it has a little bit of graphite, nutmeg, spice, earthy, all integrated to be bright and lively. And that's the sign of a really well-made wine and outstanding wine. Um, so it, I can, talk, can tell you about how they made it, but I know some of you have kind of tuned out at this point, but some of the cool things are they, they fermented it in open top fermenters and they had two daily punch downs. Punch downs are where the juice and the stems and the, the skins and the seeds are together mixed in in this big vat. And they take a big, <laughs> it's like a, a pole with a flat part and they punch, 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 and that's to mix it. So there are different methods you can do that. There are other ways like you can take a tube and, and pull it out the bottom and, um, and pour it over the top. Um, but the punch down is the traditional way to do it. Um, and I'm sure that goes with their organic biodynamic thing. One of the things um, that make it, it's awful, but it makes me smile a little bit. So when Michelle and I were traveling in France, <clears throat> some of the, um, you see like, um, you see a platform that overlooks these huge vats of, of must. And um, then <laughs> against the wall, they have to hook people in while they're punching down because while they're punching down the co2 is coming up the you know the different chemicals and they've had people 
pass out from it and you can get into a lot of trouble. So, um, so they actually hook them to the wall when they're punching down, but they do that several times a day. Um, and yes, Lisa has, Lisa's house has two daily meltdowns. She gets it. And Melissa said the wine is strong, which is true to the region and the higher level wines. Okay. Um, the other thing that's special out about this is the part of the reason it's so dark is they left it on the skins for three to five days. But also one thing you don't see a lot in winemaking is oftentimes after they move the wine, they move it again. Like they'll, they'll move it from the fermentation, the, the barrels into oak barrels, and then they'll move it again and again. These guys didn't. They moved it once. It's called racking. And that was it. Okay. Um, and, oh, they used American and and uh, French oak, okay? Um, and it's unfined, meaning it's un completely unfiltered. So if you found sediment, it wouldn't be unheard of. And then aged in barrels 29 to 30 years. Yep. Andy says the juice is good. It is good, but not if you fall into it because uh, you're already kind of lightheaded, right? So then you're trying to, you know, it's not like Lucy on... Um, I love Lucy. <laughs> um, and Leanne, I can see why you'd like it if you like the bishop. The bishop was that big, strong punch in the face, and so is this. And it's high alcohol, same. Okay. Um, all right. So, regions for GSM drink. All right. Both varietals, Grenache and Syrah, which is the ones we only have Grenache and Syrah in this one. They didn't use the Mouved in this. Okay. And the reason, by the way, that he's, that they grow the Rhone <clears throat> varietals is because that's his wife's favorite. That's Rebecca's favorite, not Peter. So he loves a Pinot Noir. And they also make a, a Viognier as well. That's small batch. That's fantastic. Um, but anyway, the varietals love warm climates, both of them. And oftentimes what grows together is blended together. Okay. Um, so it's grown in Southern France, in Spain, in the warmer New World countries. So I said the Cote d'Iron, well, France, which is the Cote d'Iron, Priorat, Spain. So just over the Pyrenees from um, the Cote d'Iron is Priorat, Spain. And I love Priorats. They're Grenache blends, usually called Garnacha in Spain. And usually they'll blend with Mouved, which they call Mazuela, and also maybe Carignan, which we'll talk about later. Okay, cheers. Yes, Andy, almost, that's true. The I Love Lucy with the chocolate conveyor belt, that's my second favorite. The wine is my first. All right, they also, um, Paso Robles, California. Many of you have heard about them and they make a lot of wines. They make some really good wines. Their GSM's drink are phenomenal, phenomenal. Um, Columbia Valley, Washington, where Lori's is from, there's more acidity there and it's pretty fruit driven. It's interesting because I've been there twice and I've, I've not had, um, a GSM from there. So, um, Lori, I'm counting on you for a full report. South Australia makes it. We talked about Shiraz, that whole Barossa Valley, all of, and the McLaren Vale. Big on GSMs there. Although theirs is Grenache Shiraz, right? Not Syrah, Shiraz blends. Okay. So, cheers. All right. Um, wines from this blend have aromas. We've already covered them, but stewed plums, black cherries, blueberries, black olives, it could. And, um, and then going along with Melissa's theme, a hint of sp um, spiced dark chocolate. So Melissa, you're getting that chocolate. Absolutely. All right. And France, it's used, um, the blend is mostly in the Southern Rhone. The most prestigious of those wines come from Chateauneuf de Pop. Um, Australia, let's see, I talked about that. Um, but they, they do their GSM blends drink is they can be some of the most expensive in the world. So the Australian uh, blends are fantastic. Um, they're used in California by Washington. So some a bunch of wine producers in Washington, and I think I talked about this two weeks ago, they created an association called the Rhone Rangers. It's led in part by Bonnie Dunes, Randall Graham, and they are big advocates of true Rhone wines. Okay. Um, and in South Africa, they make a handful of Grenaches, um, Grenache Syrah blends in the Stellenbosch region. So the interesting thing about South Africa is when I was there, I tried what they have, what they have is called, um, their, one of their red blends is Pinotage. And it blew me away. I loved it. Most people who have tried it, love it. And it's a combination of Cinso and Pinot Noir. It's, it's like a Merlot, like a medium bodied, but it has a spice to it really good. 
but um, South Africa is doing some really interesting stuff. All right. Um, so let's talk about the Cote de Rome. All right, here's France. Okay, so I'm gonna zoom in because I don't think anybody's really watching now on Instagram, okay? And here, it's opposite, here is Bordeaux, here is Provence, the south of France, and over here is the Rhone, okay? Northern Rhone, Southern Rhone, Northern Rhone, Southern Rhone, all right? So to, um, so, Next, <laughs> okay, I was gonna say to drive through France and the different wine regions, I mean, you're talking six hours, you know, maybe eight through the through the hills and valleys of um, the Rhone, it might take a little longer, but coming from Provence up to, so Provence would be down here, Southern, it's only like two and a half hour drive. So there's lots and lots of um, potential to, to travel here and to do tours and see a lot. And then the, the Northern Rhone, Greer, this is for you. Are you listening? The Northern Rhone, because I know you love this, 40 miles, that's it. It's a 40 mile stretch from here to here with some of the best wines in the world, okay? I've posted some of these maps. This is Southern Rhone. And I've posted some of these maps on my site as well, because I still haven't figured out how to share them on um, Facebook Live, okay? So <clears throat> in terms of the Rhone, the Rome. This is really important. The Rhone is known for GSM. So we're going to talk, I'm going to talk about it. Um, GSM drink and um, Provence would be incredible too. Yeah. Yeah. All right. The Greeks, the Greeks established in the Rhone, then Romans used Rhone as their highway through France and they planted vines as they went because it was the way to get to the, so the soldiers. It's the second largest wine region in France and it's along the Rhone river valley. It's divided into Northern and Southern, as I said. Um, the Northern Rhone is known for its Syrah. They do blend. If you find 100% Syrah from the Rhone, the Northern Rhone, it's incredible. The Southern Rhone is known for GSM blends, drink. It's mainly, as I said before, Grenache is king or queen and it's Grenache driven blend. So Grenache has to be a certain percentage, though they may use less, they can choose to use less. All right, so Marla asked, why does this wine stain more than others? And she, <laughs> stained her hand, I know, it stained her patio table. So for yours, so I'm gonna say this, I'm gonna say that the skins of Syrah and Grenache, especially Grenache, thick skins, and Mouvet actually, I think is a thick skin grape, so if you have a thicker red red skin, if you think about when they're when they're crushing the grapes, and it's and then the grapes are sitting, are macerating in the um, the um, in the, the stems, the seeds, and the skins. So the skins are imparting pigment, and so the longer they sit, the more pigments going in. And again, thick skinned. Stem. So there you go. That's your answer. They are, there's a lot of pigmentation in these wines. Um, so what did Andy say? The Corona, though, that's sad. <laughs> sad. All right. Um, so the Chateauneuf de Pop is one of the top wine regions in the area. And it means new castle of the Pope because the first Pope that sat in Avignon made it his residence. And so it's, that's one of the reasons, one of the ways that it got its notoriety. Another way is that whenever the popes would come and be in residence, they loved rosé. And so they would always request, request rosé, which was from Provence, but they loved the rosé from the Rhone as well. Russian royalty loves um, all of these, uh, you know, the blends that come out of the Rhone as well. Okay. All right. So that's that. So the Northern Rhone, as I said, 40 miles long, it, um, it has a continental climate, meaning it's inland, hot summers, cold winter, winters, participation, um, precipitation all year long. The hillsides are very, very steep. And so if you look at my, um, my post for this event, there's a picture of one of the hillsides in the Northern Rhone. They have to terrace them, otherwise they'll, they'll lose the soil. So it keeps the soil from eroding and it retains the warmth of the sun. But that's also why northern roans are more expensive. They have to hand harvest them. They can't send a, a machine up the hillside. They're just too steep. 
So it's a beautiful area. Um, and the, you'll see the picture that I posted on my site and it, you, it looks down over the Rhone River Valley. So you can see the river and then these terraced steep, steep slopes. How do you spell Chateau Neuf de Pop? Um, <laughs> it's Chateau Neuf de Pop and I'll put, I'll have, uh, I'll have Keith, yeah. Let me have Keith comment on it. Is that okay, honey? If I give, it, give you the spelling? Okay, it's the last one on the bottom. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great question. So the Rhone is also known for Viognier and Marsan Roussin, but those are both whites. They're phenomenal whites, unbelievable. And I think I've shared with you guys before, I love Viognier. It's the winemaker's white wine. They craft it when they have just small selections. They don't grow it a lot. It's not, it doesn't, it's not, there's not a lot of money in it, I think, because it's not as popular, but it's a beautiful crafted white wine. It's stunning. Um, and cheers to Liz for introducing me to it originally. Um, actually, it was the first one I ever had in South Africa in the 90s, but <laughs> to date me. Um, but, um, but so anyway, from the Northern Rhone, Syrah, definitely for the Reds, Viognier, Marsan, and Roussin. Okay, for the Southern Rhone, it's more of a Mediterranean climate. Summers are long and warm, winters are mild, but there's a thing called the oh thank you Greer thank you Keith there's a thing called the meat a thing a phenomenon a ph <laughs> Greer's right a phenomenon called mistral uh, wind yes okay um mistral wind okay the mistral wind and it's a huge wind the average speed is 60 miles per hour and it comes off the mountains and down through the valley and um someone's streaming Keith because I'm slowing down um and, and so it comes through the valley. And so it's good because it's a wet Mediterranean climate. So if the moisture settles, sorry, Christine, moist, um, moisture, if the, if the moisture settles, that can cause a problem for vineyards. And so, because as the moisture settles, fungus grows and they can't have that, that'll kill the vines. And so this wind takes care of the fungus blowing the, um, <clears throat> the different uh, moisture through, but, um, it also pull, rips vines out and is very destructive. It's nearly a hurricane force wind that blows pretty much from the winter all the way through the spring in the Southern Rhone. Okay. But the good thing is it's always followed by bright sunshine and clear skies. And then I mentioned those herbs before, but those indigenous herbs grow all over Southern Rhone. And so they, um, some of those flavors are incorporated into their wines. All right. Um, so Marla asked, where else besides California and France? And so I did mention those before, but you can find them all um, in warm climate vineyards, right? Australia um, in, um, so what happens is they blend with their biggest product, right? So you might find a Tempranillo blended with um, Grenache. Um, you might find, um, oh, well, uh, yeah, I kind of covered all those. It's the warm climate ones, Australia, California, France, and then um, Russia. Um, you had shared with me, Marla had shared with me Russia, and um, they're starting to now get into the into the game and market internationally their wines. So, um, and then there's more like Romania. There's one um, that was outstanding on the top um, 100, and that was from Lebanon. So, yeah, so, so other places, but it's more, those, the ones that I mentioned originally are the ones that are more um, <laughs> centralized. GSM, cheers, everybody. All right, so um, I meant, so I talked about the Southern Rhone, Grenache is king, but you'll also find Mouved, Cinso, 21 different varietals, Cunoa, Carignan, Grenache Blanc, Marsan, Rosan, Claret, and more in Southern Rhone as well. There are five main soil types, shingle, limestone, that's more like clay, um, soil with large stones and then silt and sand. And they are known for their stones in the vineyards. Yeah, yeah, because it's good, really, really good drainage. So Melissa says Russian wine. Yeah, you're gonna see more about it. I had not tasted a Russian wine, but they're definitely starting to sell them and they, I'm sure they'll become more mainstream. I'm sure that they sell to China. So cheers. Um, and so, um, so let's talk, when we talk about the Rome, we have to talk about the classification systems because Marla, um, sent me some of her pictures and it, she asked about them 
and it directly goes with the classification system okay and so each bottle is going to be labeled it's not like the bordeaux the bordeaux one i sent you was really complicated this one is more um it's pretty straightforward the bottom level is the cote de rhone appellation it's entry level easy drinking usually around 11 percent alcohol so it's just going to say on the label cote de rhone appellation or aoc <laughs> My, chucky says vodka is a fine russian wine true absolutely true <laughs> especially when um it is fermented with um fruits and things like that um and it's very clean um cote de rome village the aoc there are 95 villages and it's a step up from the coach the cote de rome aoc appellation so they have more complex um wines lower yield slightly higher alcohol that's the largest production in Southern Rhone is that Cote de Rhone Village. And that's what Marla has. So it says on her label, and you can, if you can add it to comments, Marla, that would be fantastic. But it says on the label, Cote de Rhone Village, and then it has the village. And there are actually only five um, wineries in that village. And it's, it's up and coming. I can't remember the name of it, Mar, you'd have to say, but it's an up and coming one where they predict we're gonna see more out of that village because they're making some really good, kind of lower level wines, but a step up from, from basic. The next step up is the Cote de Rhone, and those are named villages. So Cote de Rhone Village, AOC, with a specific name. So this is where in the French appellation system, it gets really, in the classification system, it gets really confusing because if you don't know this stuff, then you're not gonna know <clears throat> what to look for, right? So if one says Cote de Rhone, uh, de Rhone Village, AOC, and the other one says Cote de Rhone Village AOC, but has the village named. And if it's a specific village, that's the step up. And for those, you have to pass tastings. And it's um, they're they're really good for aging. So they're again a step up. Okay. The only way that I knew that Marla's was one level and not the other is because I looked it up. So you have to look up the the um, the label to know that. And then there's the Cote de Rhone Crew. And there are 17, that's the absolute highest level. It's about 20% of their wine production. Best vineyards. They're the vineyards on the hillsides, not in the valley. And they're by names. So um, they're, um, it's rated by slopes and hillsides. They don't, they don't mix at all the, the um, grapes. And um, I'm going to give you an example. Okay, so there are, so for example, Chateauneuf du Pape, which we, I've said several times. Their blends are Grenache, Cinso, and Mouved, and Syrah, okay? And they have, they're very characteristic. They have specific, specific characteristics to them. Crew, that's right, Lisa, crew, but C-R-U-S. And so um, if it says that on the bottle, then that's a thumbs up. Um, and so those are um, full aromatic, spicy, dark fruits, balanced, acidity, minerality, um, and they also have whites to make it more confusing. And there are some of them are very, very good if you can get a shot enough to pop white. There's Gigandas, which you guys may have heard of, which is another one. Lerac, where Cote, um, the Cote um, de Rhone wines originated from <clears throat> with their GSMs. Those have truffle and cocoa in them and some other roses and um, deep berry reds. Um, Tavel, you may have heard of because um, the, that's where the rosés would come in for the popes. Um, let's see, I had a couple others that you may have heard of. Cornus, that's a big and powerful, that's Northern Rhone, big and powerful, spicy, earthy. Um, and actually, I have right over um, on the table over there um, a baby Cornus, meaning it's made in the area, but it's not at that level. It can't be classified as a Cote de Rhone crew because it's not directly out of that specific area. There's Cote Rotier, which is a northern Syrah, phenomenal raspberry violet truffles. If you can find a Cote Rotier, like Chateauneuf de Pop, fan, fantastic, fantastic. Um, and then an, an Hermitage, Hermitage. Yes, you were supposed to drink Hermitage. Uh, I know I'm not pronouncing it right. That's a that's from northern. It's a Syrah, round and full bodied, um, and that's the one that Russian royalty really loves. So there are, again, as I mentioned, there are 17, eight in the north, nine in the south. So for us to go through them all is just too much, but each has its own outstanding characteristics. So um, Lisa asks, are the popes drinking this high quality wine <laughs> at masses? I doubt it, right? We talk about the difference between drinking and tasting, but who knows? 
So Marla says, Rhone Village, Appalachian Cote de Rhone Village, Control A, and Mise en Batel au Chateau. Okay, so we all know my French pronunciation is not great. But remember what I said last week, two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, um, if it says mise en bo that the botel, it, the it means it's bottled at the chateau, so that indicates a higher level of quality rather than you know taking a huge thing and shipping it somewhere to have have it bottled. So yeah, great, great. All right, so um, they all add different characteristics, and I have definitely talked about the GSM drink um, characteristics, what the three bring to the bottle, but. Um, I did want to add something about how Sinso, for example, I talked about that in terms of Pinotage, but how Sinso adds strawberry taste, red cherry, nectarine, pepper, raspberry. Um, it all depends on what it's blended with. On its own, Sinso is, uh, I've had it, it's pretty um, acidic, and um, but it's better in a blend. And Carignan is best when blended as well, dark and black fruits, pepper, licorice, and spicy and savory accents. So as we've moved through all of this in the last few months going through these wine tastings. I hope that you are um, able to start to see that when they're blends, they're go it's almost like a recipe. It's like cooking, right? So you have an idea of what you want it to taste like. You taste the grapes as you're going through the, the vineyards to see what you think it might taste like. Then you go through the whole process. And as you're going through, you're tasting and tasting and then <clears throat> making adjustments based on what you're tasting and adding and moving around and adding oak or taking away oak and adding fermentation or taking away fermentation. And then you get to the blend and then you have to figure out what you need in each blend. So there's a lot going on with it. There's a lot going on with it. Um, oh, Andy can't, <laughs> Andy can't be, does, do popes not drink beer? Ah, got it. <laughs> I don't know, do popes not drink beer? I don't know. If someone can answer that, that would be great. All right, so food pairings for Grenache and Syrah. So when we're talking about GSM blends, drink. Food pairings, roast, roasted leg of lamb, Cornish pasties. Lisa Gilbert, what is a Cornish pasty? <laughs> or Greer, I don't know what it is. Um, or Moroccan tangine were some of the things that were mentioned. But for Cote de Rhone, any type of meat, grilled, roasted, braised, or stewed, and then a wide variety of soft and hard cheeses. As we talk about every week, the general rule of food pairing is what grows together goes together. So the um, delicacies of the Rhone, um, for GSMs, drink again, steak with bone marrow. Oh, I don't know if you guys have ever had bone marrow, but it's yeah, we had it when we were in DC visiting Chucky. Um, fantastic, thick and heavy, but a, a wine like this, especially, gosh, this would be incredible with bone marrow. You use it almost as butter or you can on a toasted piece of bread. And with this wine, it would just be unbelievable. Um, braised lamb shoulder with um, parsnips, cumin and garlic beef strips. Those are some recommended um, pairings. So what did you all have with your um, <laughs> with your wines? All right, let's catch up. Tangine, I don't know, Mar, you'd have to look it up, a tangine. Lori had the CMS with grilled pork chops. It sounds fantastic, Lori, it really does. Um, pork chops, and what was the seasoning or the um, <clears throat> sauce on the pork chops? Leslie, yes, bone marrow. Um, Lisa says truffle fries. Oh, truffle fries would be very interesting with that salty, truffly taste to it. Yeah. Um, it is like butter, Chris. It is bone marrow like butter. Absolutely. Um, what grows together goes together. That's right, Melissa. You like that. Marla had her GSM cheers with spicy barbecue. Steak tips. Yep. Oh, tangine is a del delicious way to braise meat. Is that true, Lisa, or are you making that up? That's the question. All right. Anybody have um, a particular type of cheese that you've tried with this wine? This definitely almost has a portish taste to it, too. It's got like a tobacco-ish, um, that tobacco smoky flavor at the end. Ooh, yeah, Lori, the mesquite seasoning sounds amazing. I'm trying an everything, I think it's cheddar, everything bagel, cheddar, salty. Oh, 
Oh my gosh. That is so good. <laughs> it's so good with this cheese. Okay. So how do I, how, how do I know it's a good match? It, um, it, so it went from tasting good, but it was big and it was pretty, um, big fruit and then some acid and minerals. And then I ate my cheese and it just exploded with plum and spice. Good wine, good food. Wow. That was fantastic. All right. So Leanne has the mushroom pizza. Oh, and a peanut butter cookie. Nice. Oh, that's interesting. So the peanut butter cookie brought out the coffee flavor. Hmm. That's very interesting. I'm going to try it with some salted chocolate next when we are um, done and see how that goes. But again, I encourage you, I highly encourage you to play with your wine, try different things, see what goes well. Um, Marla said the Manchego brought out the strawberry. Yeah. What about the cheddar? That I, I'm just, this, this um, cheese, I can't say enough about it. It's Cabot. And that salt makes it go really, really well with this red, with this red wine. And then the consistency, it was like a medium to creamy cheese and it coated the palate and just joined in so nicely with the GSM. So, um, so let's see, what time is it? Okay, 7.59 and um, yes, Lisa's blood alcohol level might not be great. Um, it's totally my pleasure, Greer, and I should mention this is um, bentonite clay find, which means, Andy, it's vegan as well. So um, thank you all so much for joining us tonight, for all your comments, for joining in, for giving us all, any time that you have was greatly appreciated. I love spending time with you and um, I hope you have a wonderful week. Take care.